Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. Well, we don't have any celebrity estate plans to talk about today, but we're going to be talking about powers of attorney. And this comes out of a recent client situation that we sort of thought was something new, something we really need to share. And so welcome, everyone. I am Kirsten Howe, and this is Madison Gunn, and we are Absolute Trust Talk. As I said, we're going to talk a little bit about powers of attorney, not you should have one, you need to do it, you need to update it. But really, we're going to talk about problems that we have seen with people, clients trying to use them. And maybe some of these things will help you reconsider some of the things about your power of attorney. Okay. So Madison, well, let's just get the basics out of the way. What is a power of attorney? (laughs) What are we talking about? So a power of attorney is a legal document that you sign naming someone who is able to act on your behalf in legal or financial matters, or you can be very specific about it. But typically it's legal or financial matters when you're incapacitated. So if you can't act on your behalf, you've named someone else who can. Typically it's banking, you know, things like that. Yeah. And powers of attorney are very important. And we talk about this all the time that planning for your own incapacity It is a part of estate planning. It's a very important part of estate planning. It sometimes is not as carefully done, as thoughtfully done as planning for your death. People put a lot of energy into planning for their deaths, but don't so much tend to focus on planning for their incapacity, which we work very hard to make our clients (laughs) plan for their incapacity. We would beg to differ that that is more important than the after death part. Because if you've already passed away and they're fighting over your stuff, God help them. But if you're alive and you're suffering because there is no incapacity plan, there's somebody suffering. No one's suffering if they're fighting over your money. You know, that they brought that upon them. themselves. <laughs> yeah. If they're fighting over your money, they should suffer. But, right. but, but you shouldn't suffer as an individual because you have people fighting over who should be managing money or heaven forbid someone's mismanaging your money and you're not getting the care you need. Right. So you are the victim of a failure to plan for your incapacity, whereas your children, your beneficiaries, if you don't plan for your death, that's their problem, not your problem. It is very, very important. And the power of attorney is one of the key instruments that we use to plan for incapacity. There are a couple of different ways to do it. And one is the springing versus immediate. Let's talk about what that means. So an immediate power of attorney means exactly what it sounds like. The minute you sign it, it's valid. The person you named can use it on your behalf to act. A springing power of attorney means that there's specific language and requirements within the document that must be met in order for the document to become active, for that person to be able to act on your behalf. The typical gold standard is, one, you have to be incapacitated, and two, the person has to get two doctor's notes stating that you're incapacitated. And them being very general, those these could be customized to what you would like, but that's the general and generalization that is the gold standard of what these documents say. Right. That's a very important point. The default tends to be the document will say this power of attorney becomes effective only when I'm incapacitated. And incapacitated means two doctors in writing have said that I can't manage things for myself. But your power of attorney does not have to use two doctors. Sometimes that is very difficult. And we have seen clients struggling to get those two doctor's notes, even though everybody in the family knows this person cannot manage for themselves. But getting a doctor to spend enough time with their patient to figure that out, to write those statements, and getting two doctors to do that, it it just can be really a challenge. So we encourage our clients to think maybe there's a different path that makes more sense for me and my family. Right. And just because somebody is vulnerable doesn't mean they're incapacitated. So it could just be that you never get a doctor's note because there is no dementia or capacity issue, but they just might be vulnerable. They just might be super duper generous to their own fault, you know, to a fault of their, you know, of their own. They're giving their own money away. And that, and the doctors aren't going to see that. They're not looking at your financial records. They're looking at your medical records. Right. So That's an important point to think about. And I've even seen a requirement that the two doctor's notes have to be signed under penalty of perjury. For some reason in the last year, I've seen that a number of times in in documents written by other people. And I always thought, oh my gosh, why are we making it so hard? 
but I also recently saw two doctor's letters signed under penalty of perjury. So I, oh, so it's possible. <laughs> it's not impossible. Let's move on to some of the other things that we see people struggling with when they are trying to implement these powers of attorney. How many agents do we want serving under a power of attorney? Ideally, one. <laughs> you can have multiple in succession, but only one acting at a time is the ideal situation. There are several banks, including some banks in the top four, that will not allow two powers of attorney to act or two trustees to act for that matter. So it kind of goes to your whole estate plan. But as far as powers of attorneys are concerned, they will not even allow it. They will not allow a power of attorney out of state. So it's very common for people to want to list all their children, or if you only have two, list both your children as co-powers of attorney, co-agents for you. And that's great, but does a lot of times they can run into problems at the bank. And then of course, there's the gold standard. Everyone gets along till they don't. <laughs> yeah. And then if they don't, they don't agree, the only tiebreaker in any of this is going to be a judge. Right. And that is what we're trying to avoid by doing estate planning is we don't want families to have to go to court to help their older family members. So just name one. You can name the other kids as a backup. Just name one. So much easier. And what people don't necessarily appreciate is that a power of attorney is only good if the person you are presenting it to will accept it and honor it. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper. And yes, there are laws that say if it's a validly executed power of attorney, they have to accept it. But but, <laughs> but banks are banks and financial institutions. I, this is surprising for a lot of people, but there is no standardization across the board regarding financial institutions in terms of what they're going to accept or not accept or allow or not allow. So some might allow two co-powers of attorney, some might not. Some might not allow any powers of attorney. They were going to want their own power of attorney on their document, their letterhead, their, you know, big bank form, or if they won't take it, what is it, if it's 10 years old or older, you yeah. know, things like that. They just get very particular and you can fight it. But remember, if you're alive and incapacitated, now they're spending your money to fight to your fight financial them. institutions. Right. So yes, the law requires them to accept it. But if it's their policy to not accept it, now you're having to hire an attorney to fight and they're going to kick it up to their legal department. And that's going to cost time, money, but most importantly, time. Yeah. And you don't necessarily have time. The point here is that you've got to make your power of attorney as good as you possibly can make it. So that's one of the things we typically recommend is, you know, you have your attorney drafted power of attorney, but also go to your banks and make sure that you have something on file with your bank, whether they'll take the one that your attorney drafted or if they need their own on file. And we typically advise doing that in advance so that there is no crisis issue of the bank not taking a power of attorney so that you want to do it when time is not of the essence. You want to prepare in advance, right? That's what we're all about, advanced planning. Sometimes we'll have their own. Not all banks, not all financial institutions, but some do have their own forms and would prefer that. And their forms are only specific to the accounts you have at that financial institution. So you go to Bank of America, and I'm making this up, and yeah. you fill out their form. It applies to the, the accounts account. you have there. You still need a power of attorney created by your attorney that applies to everything else in your life. Correct. Yeah. Someone can't take your Bank of America power of attorney to Wells Fargo to access your IRA right. at Wells Fargo. Right. That's not that's not going to work. Wells Fargo is not going to take a Bank of America form, things like that. So it's only good for that bank. It's just an added feature into your estate plan. If you have filled out a power of attorney form with your attorney, and maybe you've gone and also done some powers of attorney at various banks, and then you decide to change your power of attorney. You're going to change. I don't want to name this agent. I want to switch to naming a different agent because the first agent I named, I discovered is stealing money from me or doing something bad. They, I really sh can't have this person. You can go to your attorney and redo that power of attorney. And that power of attorney will say, I revoke my prior power of attorney. But if you've got all these powers of attorney out on file with various institutions, what yeah. would you say to that? One, you have to be careful just because your power of attorney may not revoke those specific powers of attorney that are at individual financial institutions. But also, it very clearly says, usually in big, bold letters on the front of your power of attorney, that it's only as good as the bank has the knowledge of right. your power of attorney. So if you change things and you don't provide an updated power of attorney or go fill out an updated power of attorney Bank of America, Bank of America is not on the hook for still letting that other old power of attorney be effective because you didn't tell them. So right. you have to give them notice that you changed it. 
And you would typically, we always say, you don't have to notify anybody that you changed your estate plan. But in these situations, you do, because you want to make sure you don't end up with having the wrong people with access to your accounts. Because right. now it's no longer crime or a fraud if you gave express permission for them to access everything. Yeah. yeah. How are they supposed to know that they, right. they should cut off access to your accounts unless you tell them because you've given them that permission? So you want to it. ensure that that FDIC insurance is effective. You want to make sure you get that money back because they didn't have the authority to give that away. You want to tell them that they don't have the authority to let that person access your account. Right. Okay. Anything else you want to say about powers of attorney and what we've been seeing lately? And we're going to see this happening more and more. We just were talking before this episode about every week we learn new things because yeah. clients have new experiences that they share with us or that we see. And we're constantly trying to do things better, give better advice. And that's part of why we do this podcast, honestly. Yeah, we're still learning just because things are changing all the time, just as everybody else is learning. So it's we, we just have to share it as right. soon as we get it. Because the next <laughs> thing you know, it'll be different in a month anyway. So we just got to share it in as timely fashion as we can. <laughs> Very good. All right. Thanks, Madison. That was great. And thank you all for watching, listening. And we look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our ebooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting absolutetrustcouncil.com slash scheduling. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.